Assalamu alaikum. I am Sapkat Mansoor from the Center for Research in Leadership and Management Issues. Um, I welcome you as part of our Leadership Diaries uh, initiative to this interview. Uh, it is my immense pleasure uh, that we have here today with us uh, Professor Dr. Mawadat Hussain Rana. Uh, Professor Saab was the uh, founding uh, commanding officer of the Armed Forces Institute of Mental Health here in Dhabal Bindi um, and also served as the former Dean for the Faculty of Psychiatry at the CPSP. Professor Saab, thank you very much for talking to us today. You understand, you know, we've spoken about how this uh, session is meant to uh, extract some lessons from your uh, experiences as a leader. The first thing that I would like to ask you to kick us off is, um, as a leader, sir, um, what would you say characterizes your style? What defines your priorities or has defined your priorities um, and, and your um, approach to leadership? I think uh, my approach has been largely, uh, if you look at uh, the technical aspects of leadership, it's largely participatory leadership uh, in, in which you expect the team to be an integral member of decision making and uh, however uh, also having that um, feel for everybody that he is going to finally make the decision and would therefore from there on carry the responsibility of taking the blame but then also sharing the rewards with the people who have been part of your team. So that to me is the essence of how I look at things as a, as a leader. So here in the, to, to, just to take this forward, in our Pakistani context, uh, we were just talking about it a little while ago also, um, a lot of us, uh, it seems, are very uh, personality focused. Um, how is it that your style has been to involve people and to delegate to people, to share rewards, to accept blame. Generally, um, as a as a you know nation, we aren't we the opposite of this? I wouldn't say exactly opposite. I think I think unfortunately, in many a times, people who are leaders, they they never train themselves to be a leader in the first place. They have not been part of a team to start with. You know, so if you've not been part of a team, then you've not gone through the process. But if you are product of a process in which you have been led before and you have been inspired by a particular leadership style and you have reaped the benefits, you know, and uh, seen the fruits of that particular style of leadership, then you are internally convinced because of you, uh, you know, actually reaching that slot after being part of the process. Mm. In Pakistan, however, people are thrust, you know, leadership is thrust upon them. You could be somebody's son, you could be somebody's daughter. Uh, you could be part of a particular family who has been in a leadership role for a long period of time in Pakistan. And that unfortunately takes away the challenge uh, and the advantage, I would say, mm -hmm. of being part of the process. Excellent point. And yes. therefore, uh, you know, you, you start to then also feel that if I can be a leader without being the process, why bother initiating the process <laughs> to start with? And that's why uh, leadership in Pakistan uh, is brilliant, but is unsustainable. Hmm. Uh, what have been some of these influences that you just referred to that have helped shape you? I think the first uh, leadership uh, comes from your parents, how they uh, train you as a, as a child. Uh, if there is a particular kind of uh, style in Pakistan, uh, which is essentially patriarchal, in which the, the, the dadaji or the, you know, the head of the family yes. calls all the shots, and then it passes on to the, uh, you know, the eldest child. It's, you know, every house in Pakistan, unfortunately, is more like a kingdom, <laughs> you know. So yes. it's, it's very hierarchical and patriarchal. Hmm. Uh, fortunately, I was born into a house where the, uh, where my father, who was probably himself a victim of that patriarchal uh, system, migrated to Lahore from our village and from there on, decided to make the whole house extremely participatory. So my mother had as much say in, into the affairs, sometimes more, <laughs> uh, than, uh, than what we had seen in our village. And I think that that was my first model, my own father, make, making every child feel extremely important mm. and involved in the household affairs. Lastly, from Kyajkarmi Kya Pakega to, you know, where are we going to spend our Eid? You know, and uh, which school do you want to go to? 
And then I think finally it was uh, the leadership that I saw of my uh, own mentor, General uh, Ishrit Sam, um, you know, who, who was my mentor uh, when I became a psychiatrist and became a psychiatrist training. God bless his soul. Uh, eternally, he rests in peace in heaven, I'm sure. The way he would run things. And the part uh, which I particularly emphasize of his leadership is taking the blame. You know, if something didn't go right, he, you know, always put his hand up and I said, and said that, you know, it was essentially my fault. I didn't look at it uh, the way I should have. And that made us feel so confident, uh, of, although we knew that he had nothing to do with that particular thing. And, uh, but, but, you know, we, we could get away with murders literally <laughs> under his leadership. And, and the blunders that we made as, uh, as young trainees, people training ourselves into organizing various, uh, you know, on my extremely weak shoulders, he put the entire burden of organizing the first regional meeting of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, United Kingdom. First ever outside United Kingdom. And I, I was in tender years. This was my first year in training in psychiatry. So you can imagine the number of mistakes that I would have made and the blunders that I would have made. Uh, and, and therefore, I could see that he could, you know, he would look at me straight into my eyes and then eventually ended that gaze with a smile <laughs> rather than shouting at me. So I think, I think that is where the inspiration came from. You, you spoke about your background with uh, uh, the military. Of course, that's where you spent a significant part of your career. And Absolutely. from a distance, uh, um, from a distance, it would seem that within the military, just a hierarchical and there are that you know, rewards and um, uh, progress is not tied so much um, to actually um, bringing results or achieving things outside the path which uh, the military has defined for someone. And yet, we see you having worked. Um, so hard for the establishment of this institute. What is it that motivates people like you? I, th I think uh, largely people misread, uh, particularly Pakistan Armed Forces. I, th I think nothing that I've done would have been possible anywhere but in Pakistan Armed Forces. Really? It's an amazing organization in the sense that it's, it's like this island, uh, you know, in, in Pakistan, where you are held responsible, but you're also rewarded and appreciated for whatever you do, you see, but within certain limits, with constant understanding of regulations and law, laws, and I think that, that, that element is so close to nature, because that's exactly what nature is. It punishes you very bad when you behave the opposite of the law of the nature. Yes, I you see, and it does not, law does not discriminate so, armed forces is non-discriminatory, by and large, I would say, by and large, if I compare it with all other organizations that I've had the uh, good fortune of watching, uh, I think Pakistan armed forces in particular is non-discriminatory. And across the board, you know, it has the same regulation and implementation of regulations for everybody. So you're rewarded for what you do, but you're also punished for what you do, do or you try to do it the wrong way. So I think that has helped me a great deal. Uh, on account of the wild uh, nature that I had, on account of my being extremely idealistic and dream-oriented uh, individual, not very practical at certain levels, and thinking constantly about my dreams and unrealistic uh, ways of looking at things. So I think it, it, it uh, sort of chiseled me adequately to, uh, and if it was, you know, in another organization, people, people didn't, I would have probably destroyed myself, myself completely. So this this limit setting that uh, that armed forces gave me has been absolutely crucial. And I got into Pakistan armed forces, uh, you know, when I was what probably 18 years old, you know. So exactly at that time when you are about to destroy yourself uh, <laughs> by through your wild ideas, I got into the Pakistan armed forces. And for for the next 1977 to 2013. I'm horrible at math, so you can make the calculation <laughs> how many years it protected me from myself. Because in most situations and circumstances, I've seen people destroying themselves much before anybody else destroys themselves. 
So it has had a huge nurturing role in my life. What I want to ask you now, sir, is um, uh, something that I'm personally very eager to uh, learn about from mm -hmm. you. It is your, uh, how is it that you take decisions? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is uh, one extreme where people will analyze things too much. On the other extreme, um, decisions will sometimes be, be taken on uh, a whim, if you will. Uh, how do you avoid being here, uh, not there? I, I think all decision making, ideally speaking, uh, um, why I'm saying this is uh, largely uh, for an educational purpose rather than, you know, uh, um, sounding uh, that I always do it that, that way. I'll tell you how I do it. <laughs> but I think, ideally speaking, a decision has to be made with a combination of things. First of all, in that, is inspirational. I think there's a huge role of an inspirational, what you call a visionary look at what is going to happen with these set of circumstances. A leader has to look far ahead of all those he is leading and look at probably as far as he can in terms of an inspiration, in terms of a vision, or what is likely to happen. So that to me is the frame in which he starts to work. Now, exact opposite of that is, if you just get lost into the uh, micro aspects of the things and see how I can please everybody and how I can everybody be hanky-dory and be happy with the decision that I'm going to make. So if you're looking for that kind of approval and appeasement, then you're likely to make a decision that's more of a posing for the best pose in a given situation or rather than deciding what you're supposed to decide based on your inspiration and vision. I think the starting point for me would be that. So you, everybody can, you know, mm. be very unhappy with the, what I eventually decide. As long as I, I know that as a decision maker, I'm looking at the bigger picture and seeing ahead. That to me is key and crucial uh, in terms of uh, the starting point. Now, having done that, I think the next aspect is to make sure the decision that you make is rational. Rational. Yeah. I think rationality is a huge human attribute, largely, uh, you know, um, not drawn upon in most decisions. If your decision is irrational, it's going to bounce back. See, because of the same fact that I said earlier, laws of nature, they are going to reject it. Just because the nature is rational. Although sometimes we cannot see the rationality in a particular um, way nature operates. Maybe it's on a bigger time scale. Yes, because uh, it, it's, it's on the scale of thousands of years, millions of years, you know. So therefore, at a particular point in time, if you take a snapshot, it, it sounds all ridiculous. But it is rational. Nature wouldn't be what it is if it was irrational. So rationality to me is extremely important. The next step. The third aspect, which is probably the hardest for a, for a leader, particularly operating in our environment, is objectivity. You try and take as much of yourself out of that decision as possible. That subjective, man, the ego, how it is going to benefit me, you know, how it is going to benefit my offsprings, my family, you know. So that, that, that subjective aspect, both in terms of intellect as well as in terms of um, the rewards attached to that particular or the punishments, the avoid avoidance of the punishments in that particular decision, the next challenge that a leader needs to overcome. Prudence. Sometimes you know what is right, but you don't execute it at that point in time because the time is not right. Mm. So, so everybody can say, okay, let us do this. But it is for the leader to decide the timing of that decision. When would it sound uh, practical and needs to be done? Rather than thinking, okay, this is right, let me go ahead with it. You see, I keep giving the example of uh, Mansoor Halaj, on which probably your name is, uh, you know. He said, probably in my opinion, after Quran, one of the most profound messages mm. that human beings could ever think about. The potential of a human being, Anal Haq. Now, he said it in God hand. Now, the same thing was said by Allah Iqbal. Same thing. 
didn't get time. Hakim ul Umat, the wise man, the prudent man. Look how he says it. Khudi ka sirre neha la ilaha illallah. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. It is probably the best possible translation of Inal Anal Haq. I've never seen it this way, but you're right. Yes, yes. it Khudi makes sense. Sirre neha la ilaha illallah. Imagine. I mean, he's saying the same thing, but in a prudent way, at the right time when people could understand. Now, in an era of kingdoms where you know everybody is egoistic, to attribute that every individual is haq is an extremely wild thought. Beautifully conceived, couldn't be something wiser and brilliant than what Mansoor says, but probably said at the wrong time. In a in a in a in not so prudent a circumstance. So I I cannot ever think of uh, you know even. Remotely considering the possibility of criticizing the intellect to the level of Mansoor, but my my opinion, very humble opinion, is that probably on a scale of zero to ten, in terms of prudence, he wouldn't score very high. So for a leader, probably prudence is extremely important. And last of all comes that paralyzing aspect that you're talking about: the evidence, the the data, uh, the uh, discussions, the delay in the decision to see what. You know, everybody is saying about it. Those aspects are important, but they cannot be your guiding principles. They're important because that would make a manager out of you, not a leader. And the manager is just looking at those graphs and those <laughs> statistics. And they're important, but they have, they are a little piece in the big jigsaw puzzle. Important piece, but not the only piece. And that is when a leader needs to go in with his uh, uh, people he's leading with options. And ask them to comment upon those options, and that is invaluable data, invaluable because it then uh, you know takes the subjectivity away. Uh, if you have given the confidence to your team, they would tear you apart for the wrong things that you are putting into that particular data, or if you've got it wrong somewhere. And if you've given them that confidence, they will be able to get back to you. So to come and go to these people who are your team members with those options, and then on that discussion, based on that discussion. And looking at the long term, short term, medium term uh, consequences of each of those options, you come up with a solution. Mm. Implement it, but always, almost always, come back to evaluate your decision. I think that's one thing that's missing. Most leaders would implement and would say, "Okay, I've done it." Now, if you do not evaluate what you have done. Subsequently, and this evaluation must be internal as well as external evaluation. You need somebody else to come to you and say, "Okay, this is how it looks from outside." And if you're not ready to listen to how it looks from outside, and in measurable terms, I think this decision is faulty because you haven't gotten it evaluated. So, and if you do not make this entire process um, an unholy text and something that that uh, has to be dynamic and changeable. If it doesn't work, you must have that capacity as a leader to change and alter and make, and therefore comes the the acceptance of the blame. Say, okay, I got it wrong. I got it wrong. I'm ready to face the music that follows, but let us try and change this like this. And this, I think, this would complete the cycle uh, once the evaluation is there and the dynamicity of your decisions. If there are no holy decisions that you make. And you're ready to take the blame and change. I think decision making can improve. Uh, very informative. In the Pakistani context, however, sir, a, a question which leads from what we were just talking about. Um, some leaders or some people that I've spoken to, they feel that um, uh, you know, unless there is a little distance between the leader and the followers, uh, then that uh, formal authority which the leader has as a source of power gets diluted. Um, have, is that something that you have seen with, with an increase in the amount of participation that people have in your teams? Uh, has, has that ever? I wouldn't completely reject that. I think there has to be, a, no matter how, how weird it sounds and uh, grandiose it appears, I think that there has to be a certain degree of mystique about uh, a leader. You know, he needs to be not always be extremely predictable and therefore taken for a ride. This is how he's going to, you know, because of that, he is likely to be surrounded by sycophants, 
And the biggest uh, tragedy that can happen to a leader is a collection of those people around him who say, wah, 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 wah. Kya baat hai aapki, you know? Because the, this, this particular attitude is likely to eclipse your thinking, it is likely to uh, burn your intellect very badly, and it is going to decrease your objectivity about things. Human beings are essentially narcissistic. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we are. You know, we love ourselves. And it, there's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. A certain degree of narcissism is actually required in a leader, just because he's good. You know, and he has to understand that he is good. No need for false humility. You absolutely <laughs> no need. Yet, with it comes a certain degree of humility that he understands that, uh, you know, all of this is just not me. I am a product. I am a product of somebody. So, if I am a product, I cannot take all the credits as a product. The credit has to be of the creator and of all those people who have you know, to work so hard to bring you to where you are. You mentor extensively, sir. Um, it's easy to understand uh, from a young person's point of view uh, the benefits of having a mentor. But for a uh, senior leader like yourself, what motivates you to take out, uh, you know, such a lot of time from such a busy schedule and invest in younger people? Uh, l let me share it with you. That it's for selfish reasons, frankly. <laughs> 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 Simply because of the fact that, you know, long time ago, the very initial ayats of Alif Lam Mim, uh, Surah Al Baqarah, states the concept of self actualization, Muflehun. And just before that, it gives you the concept of Yunfikun. A Yunfik is actually a tube which is often open from both ends. So if you start to believe that my self actualization as a human being, is only if I pass on the riches that I have gotten or if I may use the word of Quran, return those riches. Ah. I think the word from Quran is return. Why don't you return it to where it belongs? So I think anything that comes my way in terms of my material riches or in terms of my intellectual riches or in terms of my understanding of any particular aspect or my knowledge or my skills, uh, or any specific endowment uh, that comes my way, I have to pass it on. I have to pass it. It doesn't belong to me. It, it belongs somewhere else. It has come from somewhere else. So it must go somewhere else. If you want to call that mentoring, be it. <laughs> but it is, it, it is only through this method that I will be able to proudly go on the journey of self-actualization and muflehun if I have to. If a tube starts to accumulate, what would happen? If it is going to then eventually be eroded, completely destroyed by what it retains. Mm. So an efficiency of a tube is only as much as it can, it has the capacity That's to pass on. So I think, I think as, as, as somebody who got the best in life, has a responsibility primarily towards its own self to pass it on, otherwise it will stagnate and erode me completely and destroy me eventually. So probably this passing on, what I get is pass on uh, to the people uh, and the wonderful, wonderful team members that I've always had. It's a matter of passing on and in the process probably, you know, getting a little more self-actualized each time. Uh, when you uh, work with young people, when you mentor people, when you uh, pick people for your team, uh, what is it really that you look for in the private sector, when people, when organizations are hiring people, uh, traditionally they've looked at seeing where, where there is a match in experience. Um, but, you know, since uh, a few years now, there has been a movement away from that and people are now saying, don't hire based on past uh, experience and achievements, hire people uh, based on potential. So, what is it that, uh, what, what, what is the metric that you use? I think my responsibility as a leader, uh, or if, if, if I was heading an organization, is to start to first of all believe and understand the concept of divine potential of a human being. Divine potential? Yeah. I think each individual, you know when, when God says, my breath into you, now my breath into you is not literally, you know, it's not passed on oxygen into your lungs. <laughs> it, it is the divine potential that a human being has. Khudi or Selenium, hmm. you know, again that Anandha concept. 
So that is the divine potential that each human being comes into this world with. That's the promise. That's the promise of nature. Everybody comes with a divine potential. It is the responsibility of the community. It is the responsibility of the family. It is the responsibility of Pakistan Cricket Board. It is the responsibility of uh, uh, the society at large and organizations who employ people to contribute towards the realization of that divine potential. Mm. Now, what we try to do, however, is to try and break people and use them more as parts in the machine that you are running. So they can be, you can go to hell as far as their potential <laughs> is concerned. I just want to use them into my machine to enhance its efficiency. That's, that it, to me is actually the true definition of exploitation. Whenever you will exploit a human being, you will in the short run gain, but in the long run lose. This is something it's a short term strategy of an organization. Mm. When it starts to decimate people, to uh, make them uh, become part of that machine and contribute, uh, that is when I think it's a, it's a disaster. So, so I think the real gift that you can give to human beings is freedom. Freedom. Freedom is the best gift that you can give to people that you hire. The freedom of thought, the pr freedom of decision making, the freedom of uh, expression of uh, speech, they're, they're basic human rights. I mean, I'm not sort of talking something philosophical here, they're essentially basic human rights. Freedom. Now, with that freedom comes the opportunities and the guidance to always stay on a path, to dwell on a path in a particular direction of growth and nurturance of self and other. In the end, sir, um, something that, uh, again, I am personally very interested in hearing and learning from you about, um, success. So, of course, you know, there is the um, materialistic view of success. The more money that you have, the more successful you are. And then, of course, uh, other people define it differently. Just today, when you were uh, describing some of these things, you pointed at another metric for success, uh, self-actualization. My question to you, sir, is throughout the course of your career, um, has the definition of success that you've had for yourself, has it changed? Um, and if so, how has it evolved? And how do you define success today? I think it has evolved, clearly. And uh, particularly on this particular aspect, I feel that I'm a little wiser, if not more, in terms of defining success. I started, obviously, like everybody else in Pakistan, uh, defining my success with the number of marks that I get. Uh, and as a bowler, if I'm able to take a, a number of wickets uh, in the match that I'm playing. So it was always about gaining something, you know, and getting the applause. So that to me was applause of the mother, applause of the parents, applause of the society, teachers, Shabash, very good, you know, that, that was been the external motivation, largely external motivation of rewards and you know, appeasement and appreciation. Over the years, what I started to learn was that you need to stop to compete with people in terms of success. You have to start to believe in the fact that the world is round. And in a round world, in a, you know, uh, if I may use this, this world, nobody can be ahead of anybody. You're right. <laughs> if I drew a point here and a hair and a hair, who is ahead of whom? Particularly when each individual has had his unique potential. Beautiful. Because nature doesn't just, you know, repeat itself. It does, just does not repeat itself. It just So, you know, if you want to think about this, that you are competing with someone. Beautiful. You are competing with your own You are competing with your own access. You are competing with your own And Jupiter is certainly not ahead of us in any way. So they're all in their own orbit and each human being is therefore in their own orbit. So now your success would be if your today is better than yesterday, if you've moved on in terms of your thinking patterns, in terms of your knowledge and understanding, in terms of your skills and intellectual development, in terms of your understanding of life, understanding of other human beings, understanding of uh, the nature and its laws and regulations. If you have been able to do that, 
that my today is better than yesterday, I am successful. But if I have been unfortunately comparing myself with you, then I'm afraid I will always be redefining success every day because, you know, by the time that I've moved, you moved another two squares and, you know, <laughs> I just can't help feeling jealous and morbidly lustful and constantly feeling bad about myself. And then nothing would be enough. And therefore, I think a lot of this has to come from the kind of parenting that we do of our children. I think the parenting that we do is largely comparative. And we constantly compare uh, uh, your successful sister with you, with uh, you as a successful elder brother or your successful younger brother. We're constantly first comparing children with each other. Then we start to compare with them, with their cousins. Then we start to compare them with their class fellows. And therefore, they're never good enough. I have heard a parent saying, a child coming in rushing and saying, I've got 100%. And the first question was, or kiske 100%? God, how morbid can you get in terms of parents? So if very early in your child, you start to make him understand the concept that we've all seen as a video in uh, Paralympics, where, uh, you know, all those people who had various kinds of disabilities joined hand and crossed the line together. together yes. That is when an individual turns into a community and community into a country and the country into a world where the linking up of individuals in terms of pursuing a goal is as important as the goal in itself. It is this relationship and bonding and holding hands with each other that's extremely important. The lack of competition, no matter what the price of it is. I'm, I'm sure many people would consider this a mad concept and an impractical one. But then that's not the first time that I've been talking like that. So uh, uh, I believe in this idealistic concept that it's extremely important that you are not stepping on somebody's head and shoulders while showing yourself that you are heads and shoulders above everybody else. That to me is certainly not success. Sir, it has been hugely educative to speak to you and I wish that we will have this opportunity again, but I am uh, aware pleasure. of your schedule. With pleasure. Uh, so, we will have a lot of time, but thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. Thank you.